All right, so uh, Revelation chapter 2, we're going to keep continuing on. We started two weeks ago with, uh, with the church of Laodicea, right? I mean, all, several of y'all were here for that, right? And then, uh, so then we backed up 10 yards upon it, went back to the first church of the seven churches, the church of Ephesus. And I didn't quite get finished with the church of Ephesus last week, so, uh, so we're going to have a little backup and punt. And then go again. It's like like drawing back a bow. You get ready to shoot. Right? Are you going to keep us after class? We may keep you after class. Yeah. If you don't behave yourself. Send you to the principal's office. Because Sheila's not here. <laughs> so. so Revelation 2. Let's, let's take a walk through these scriptures here. Verse 1 says, uh, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, right. So who's speaking here? All right, it's getting ready to define. At every church, he, he reiterates who it is that's speaking. And Jesus himself divine, defines himself seven different ways at every church. So if you look at the whole, whoo, I can't wait to do that in a few weeks. And we'll look at the whole of the seven churches and how Jesus defines himself, what he says about an overcomer and all, all these things. When you put the whole picture together, it's, I'm excited for that part. But we ain't got there yet. So in this, he says, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. So you got two different things. And if you just read that verse, you might say, what? <laughs> that don't make a lick of sense to me, right? So you back up one verse, and you look at Revelation 1, verse 20, and he says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, he says, The seven stars in his right hand are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So he's walking in the midst of the candlesticks and he has seven stars in his right hand. And that's an angel, which just means messenger. Could be, you know, one of them, or it could just be a, a Paul or a Timothy or, or a Peter, you know, a, a messenger, whoever is given to deliver this message to the churches. So, uh, so in that, he says, who's speaking? Just so you know, it's Jesus and I'm the one that has the stars in his right in my right hand. Okay? And then uh, then verse 2 says, I know thy works, thy labor, and thy patience. How thou cannot bear them which are evil. Now hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. So here's where we, we jumped into the, the teaching on. Judging God, God is the ultimate judge, correct? Right? So how is God God is judging them on what merit? This is by their works. He's judging them by what they do, what they have done, what they continue to do. So he's judging them on their on these merits, but he's also in this same thing. In the same verse, you see lots of, lots of stuff to unpack in this verse. He's judging them by what they do, but also he's admonishing them. He's, he's, uh, he's uh, exhorting them. He's lifting them up. He's telling them what a good job they're doing. You know, as, as, a, as a parent, you know, sometimes you got to do that. Say, well, you did, you did a fine job, but, right, if you could fix this, that'd be great, you know. Or how many teachers? We, I don't know, there's one teacher. Anybody else been a teacher in here? Anybody else? Nobody else? But, you know, it's kind of how you you got to handle kids. You know, we're all kids in God's eyes, right? We're all children of God. We should be. So so this is how God handles his kids. He admonishes them. So you, that's a great job. That's what you're doing. Before he gives the but. So in this... We'll see what, what is he, he's saying, I know your works. And, and then he says, labor and patience. That, that, that's something that doesn't come by easy, does it? How, how many of y'all have ever prayed for, pay, prayed for patience? Yeah? How do you get it? You get it through 
trials. You know, that's how you gain patience is through trials. So in this, he says, and how you cannot bear them which are evil, right? You can't, you don't put up with those that are evil, colon, there's a colon there. So after the colon defines what he's talking about, putting up with those that are evil. So it doesn't, it's not a blanket statement. So you just don't put up with junk. You don't put up with nothing. No, there's, there's a specific point he's getting to. He says, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. You try them which say they are apostles and are not. These are the evil men that you don't put up with. Those that claim to be apostles and are not. If we, if we turn back to 2 Corinthians 11, 2 Corinthians 11, back in the beginning of the ends, or I guess 2 book of the ends, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13, Paul gives the same warning. 11, 13. He says, for such are false apostles. So there's true apostles and there's false apostles. And he goes into, into a lot of this chapter defining what a false apostle is. Such are false apostles deceitful workers transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. In verse 14, for no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. An angel of light. So, angel is a, or Satan is a deceiver and these guys are workers of Satan which are making themselves out to be servants of God. Right? And what, what is, what is uh, the word apostle means? A called out ambassador for Christ, right? Someone who's set apart for a purpose to be an ambassador to Christ. What what do our earthly ambassadors do, you know, for our governments? Ah, come on. <laughs> They're supposed to go into different countries and represent the country that they're representing, right? So so for an apostle, they go they're called out, set apart, and say, hey, this is what you're going to do. You're going to go somewhere and be a representation for Jesus Christ, right? We need a lot more of those in government Amen. that represent Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? That, that, that I have a high moral standard that comes from God's word and not from their own made-up imagination, right? So that would be a wonderful thing to see. Amen? So... Called out ambassador for Christ, which in a way, we are all called out ambassadors for Christ. He, we take him with us wherever we go. Whatever situation that we, that we step into or visit, we are ambassadors for Christ in that, right? And, and in this, some people, certain churches believe that there are no more apostles after the, the eleven. And then they replaced it with Matthias. And then Paul calls himself an apostle. So there's 13. But if you keep reading, well, there's several more in Scripture. So there, you can't narrow it down to just the 13. There's more. And then, then as you look in Revelation, in the end, there's also prophets and apostles in the end that are martyred. So there must be more apostles and prophets. So they didn't stop with the originals. They had to continue, and if you would like more proof, I could go through all the evidence that I believe God reveals in his word that those continue. So, uh, and then, are there more apostles? So, take a look at uh, 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12, 28, while I'm on the... On my, I'm on the apostle kick here. And this, this is the, uh, excuse me, God's design for how the church operates, right? So the, these things, for the church to be fruitful, to, for to be in operation as God designed it to be, these things have to be there and in operation. So verse 28 says, God had set some in the church. And then he lists them in order. First, apostles, called out sent ones, right? Ambassadors. 
Secondarily, prophets. What was a prophet? Someone who boldly speaks God's word. Thirdly, teachers. Right? If you, if you evangelize, you share Jesus with somebody, you need to put them somewhere they, where they can be taught God's word. So teachers. After that, oh, miracles. Did, did God's miracles stop? No. How many of y'all have ever witnessed God do an amazing work and a miracle? Yeah. I is one, okay? That's not good English, but I, I am one. And so are you. And then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. And he says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Have all the gift of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? And the answer is no. But covet earnestly the best gifts. Yet I show you a more excellent way. So, so he's got all these things that, that are listed that should be in part in the part of the new church that, that is being established. And look at uh, Ephesians 4. Two books over. Ephesians 4, verse 11. Ephesians 4, verse 11. It says he gave some apostles, some prophets, almost the same list. Right? He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Why? Some people like to stop with that and say, okay, give me one of those titles. Job says, I dare not give a man a title or lest the Lord will take me away. So we should be quick to give titles. But see, apostle prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. We, the old school, we called it the fivefold ministry. Y'all ever heard that before? The fivefold ministry, right? And it says, why? Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints. Why do you have these in order? Because these in action help to perfect God's people through their teaching, through their admonishing, through their leading, through their guiding, through their discipleship, these help perfect the saints, right? Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. How do you do that? Well, you got to have these in order. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, and it says for how long? How long are these things to be in order? Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God into a perfect man under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So how long are these to be in order? Until the church is totally unified and perfected. When's that going to happen? When Jesus comes. Right? So, Amen. So how long is that going to that need to be in place? The fivefold ministry and the other ones? Until Jesus returns. These are necessary, integral parts of the body of Christ. Right? And, and it is not for self-proclaimed prophets. Or self-proclaimed. I'm an apostle. You know? Look at me. Look at me. I've got a name tag. Yeah, I'm a shirt. I'm an apostle. Right? That's not what it's for. And so this is, this is what you do for the perfecting of the saints. Yeah. Right. Not to lift yourself up, but you need to be humble. Amen? Amen. All right, so back to Revelation. Revelation 3. I lost my spot. There we go. He says, verse 8, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an... Chapter 2. Wrong chapter. Verse 2. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. How that cannot bear them which are evil. Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not. And have found them liars. So all this, all this is Jesus admonishing this church. You've done a great job with this. Right? And then continues on. He continues on verse 3. And has borne. And, and that, that means they, they've carried a heavy burden. They've carried a weight. This, this is not an easy way to carry. You have a responsibility to call out false prophets. Right? What, what is Bob, Paul says, mark them and avoid them. Mark them, warn, and avoid them. So 
So you born, you've taken this burden and has patience. Patience. Sounds so nice, he said it twice. And you have patience. And he said, for my name's sake. So he's saying, why, what's, why, are you, why are you doing this? And you're doing it for my name's sake, right? What, what does it say in Matthew 7? He says, the, it says uh, those say, but, but Lord, we've cast out demons in your name and did many wonderful works in your name and prophesied in your name. And what does Jesus say? Depart from me, you worker for, of iniquity. I never knew you. So, but they're doing all this in his name. He says, well, you can do, still do things in God's name and miss the mark. Right? So it said, if you, for my name's sake, you have labored and have not fainted. You've labored. You're not giving up. You've, you've done what you're supposed to do. And you say you did it for the name of Christ. And then here comes the but. Here comes the but. Verse 5. Remember. No, no, no. Verse 4. I'm sorry. Nevertheless. That's the same as saying, but. Right? Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. You got all this going good for you, but you've missed out. You missed the motivation. You've missed what you have called to do. You may be doing it in my name, but when you cut out the love of God out of the work of God, you have a vain act. Right? It's not you're not doing any good if you miss out on the love of God. And you take that out of out of the equation. So he says, I have somewhat against you because you have left your first love. Now, if you can continue reading down, it says, Well, because they've done this, they're risking everything. Everything that matters, their eternal life. And this is not speaking to one person, this is speaking to a whole church, right? So in, uh, so verse five, let's continue on before I jump off. Remember, therefore, from which you have fallen, thou, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will, rem and will remove thy candlestick, out of his place, except thou repent. What's the first thing he tells them? Say, so here's the problem. The problem is you've left your first love. So it's good to tell the problem. What, what if you went to a doctor and all they said, hey, you got cancer, or, you, or you're sick, or you got this, and they said, have a, good, have a nice day. Right? What good would it do if he didn't tell you, give you a, a, a solution? Right? So God is telling what the problem is, and now he's giving what the solution is. What do you have to do first? First things first. Page two. Come on. First things first. The remedy. Remember from where you've fallen. Well, what's that mean? Well, they, they've fallen, fallen from grace. They've departed. So it said, remember what it was like when you truly served me with all of your heart. You, when you really loved me with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Remember what that was like. First things first. When, like when David cried in Psalm 51, restore to me the joy of my salvation. They, God wants you to go back to the very beginning, remember what it was like when you embraced my love and returned it to me. Okay? Second thing first, remember therefore from whence you were fallen, so they fell, right? And do what? Repent. What's, what's it mean to repent? Take a look at Romans, Romans 12. Romans 12. Roaming through the Bible here. Romans 12, we, we call this the, the repentance verses. 
It doesn't say repentance, but it tells what it is. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, that's like, you know, I'm begging you, I'm pleading with you. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, so he's talking to the church, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Christ died for you. It's only reasonable that you die for him, that you lay down your life for him. Verse 2, and there's the repentance verse. Be not conformed to the world, to the patterns of the world, to the loves of the world, to the wants of the world. Don't conform yourself to them, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Change the way you think. Why? That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The, the Greek word is met, metanoia. Change the way you think. And if you change the way you think, then you will change the way you act. You can change the way you act without changing the way you think, and all you do is keep going in circles. We call it the cycle of sin. You keep going around circle. But if you change the way you think, and you think differently about who God is, and about what sin is, and then how much you want to please and love the one that loved you so much, you will stop doing and going in the way that you're going. It's not just pulling 180, it's to, <laughs> that turns into another 180 that ends up a 360. It's to just to turn from going here and go that way and keep going that way. And you can't do that unless you change the way you think. Well, and uh, turn with me to... Uh, da, 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 da. 1 Timothy 5, 12. 1 Timothy 5, 12. <coughs> kind of sounds just like what, Tim, what Paul is telling to Timothy sounds just like what Jesus is telling to this church of Ephesus. He says, having damnation because they cast off their first faith. They have damnation. Why? Because they saw, they thought at what at one time was the most valuable thing that they could possess, they cast it off. What's the result of that? Damnation. What, what's the result of this church in Revelation? They lost their first love. What's the result? Same thing. Damnation. Damnation. Now turn with me to uh, Hebrews. Next book over to the right. Hebrews 5. Verse 12. So here's another admonishment. Correction. And this is to the whole body of Christ. It's not written to, to, you know, it's written Hebrews to the Jews first and foremost, but it's also written to us. Amen. There's not a word in Holy Scripture that is not for us as well. It says, For, the, for when the time ye ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again. So you should be the ones teaching the classes. You should be the ones being disciples and making disciples, but you missed out on something. Now you need someone to teach you again. And what, what is that? Which be the first principles of the oracles of God. So go back to the beginning. And he said, you are some that have, that such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. So you've been in it for a while, but yet you're still on the milk. You've not moved up, moved up to the stake. Why is that? Something happened. With, so he's saying you missed something at the beginning. So let's go back to the beginning and start all over. And maybe you'll catch on to what you missed out on. And then you will grow and mature and be perfect. And be one of those that are leading others and be an integral part of the community of Christ. 
So move from the milk to the meat. And then verse 13, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. So you're a baby on the mama's milk. It's time to grow up. Well, how do you grow up? Verse 14, strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So if you're on the milk, you're still not right what good and evil is. So those that are on the meat, it's clear, it's obvious. Verse, or chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, so you got to find out why the wherefore, the therefore, it's wherefore, therefore, wherefore, therefore. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Not laying again the foundation. See, it's time for you to grow up, but here's the foundational things that you should have known. Right? It, it, it Paul, or the writer, it's not Paul, but the writer is giving them a, a swift kick in the hiney. Said, grow up, get out of the nest, get off the mill, and grow up. So laying in the foundations, here's the foundational things, repentance from dead works, and faith towards God. They work together. Repentance from dead works, what you did against God, and faith towards God is what you do now for God. <clears throat> Two, doctrines of baptisms. This should be an integral part of every baby believer. Doctrines of baptisms. What's about? Why we do it? Laying on of hands. Pretty important part of a believer's walk. And of resurrection of the dead. Was Jesus raised from the dead? Yes. Will all believers be raised from the dead? Yes. So that, that's an integral part of knowing we, we don't just all die like the Sadducees thought. You don't just, you're not dead and gone. There is a resurrection of the dead. And then of eternal judgment. Really important. There is an eternal hell. And there's an eternal heaven. There's the lake of fire. This is an important part. If you don't know this, then you're missing out. Right? And this we will do if God permit. This we will do if God permit. And I'm not going to continue on there for time's sake. Go back. Go back to Revelation. Chapter 2, verse 5 again. Remember, therefore, from whence you are fallen. So you got to remember where you was, what you fell from. And repent and do the first works. Repentance, baptism. It's like you're starting off fresh. Repent and do your first works. Or else I will come to you quickly and remove thy candlestick out of this place. Except... You repent. If you don't repent and do first works again, your place in the presence of God is forfeit. It's gone. You no longer have a place with me for eternity. And so if you don't have a place with the Lord for eternity, then you're home for all eternity is a lake of fire where the, the, the devil, the false prophet, and the antichrist is going to be. And ain't nobody wants to be there. Ain't nobody wants to be there. So then he continues on. He said, here's the, here's the solution. He said, so, so Jesus says, here's what's bad. Or here's what's good. Here's what's bad. And now he's going to come back around and he's going to exhort them one more time. And he says, this thou hast, thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. What's the deeds of the Nicolaitans? I think I've taught on that before. They, a, a wicked group of people, one of the first deacons that was chosen fell from grace, started teaching false doctrine. He, he taught uh, something that's taught in a lot of churches today. Well, when you come to Christ and you believe on Jesus, it doesn't matter what you do after that. That's just sins of the flesh. Right? And that's what the doctrine of the Nicolaitans is. It doesn't matter what you do in your flesh. You still get to go to heaven. That's a lie from the pit of hell. 
He, he also taught that, that there's no, once you come to Christ, there's no such thing as marriage anymore. That you can have whoever's wife that you want. That is not a good idea, Randy. <laughs> it, it's, it's evil and it's twisted doctrine. But you can see, uh, and it kind of creeps in. That's, it's, it's, it's still alive and well today. But he says, he doesn't say, shame on you for hating the Nicolaitans. No. See, he's admonishing you. This is a good thing that you're doing for hating the deeds, not the Nicolaitans themselves, but you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, right? What well, scripture scripture says in uh, Psalm ninety-seven, verse ten it says, "Ye that love the Lord hate evil. Ye that love the Lord hate <laughs> evil. So can you love and hate? Yes, right." If you love God, then you must hate evil. If you don't love God, then you hate God. And you love evil. When you come to Christ, the tables turn. And, and Proverbs 6 gives a list of things that God hates. Shedding of innocent blood is one of them. One thing that God hates, detests, is the shedding of innocent blood. So here he says, Do you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate? Then verse 7. My last verse. Okay. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. How many ears you got? What, what, what is it in, the, in that place? Says, Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. <laughs> kind of the same thing. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Amen. That's eternal life. If you're an overcomer in Christ Jesus, you get to eat of the tree of life. If you're not an overcomer, it says it's, it's the same backwards and forwards. So if you're not an overcomer, do you get to eat of the tree of life? No. So if you are an overcomer, you get to eat the tree of life. If you're not an overcomer, you don't get to eat the tree of life. If you don't eat the tree of life, you don't have eternal life. So here's, here's our admonishment and correction. Be an overcomer on a daily basis, right? We should not be the same Christians that we were a year ago or a month ago or a day ago. Because as we're continually drawing closer to Christ, he is changing us to look more like him. How are we to be an overcomer? By our own selves? Is it by my strength? By my willpower? No. no. Not by might. Not by power. But by thy spirit, says the Lord. If you're a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, his Holy Spirit lives within you and gives you everything that you need to overcome. Amen? And when, when you look, start looking throughout Scripture of what, what is given to overcomers, I mean, the definition of uh, an overcomer throughout Scripture, it's like you're in an army and you're facing an over, another army and you obliterated them. You overcame them. Totally. And that's what we have to do in our life against sin and wickedness and darkness. Obliterate it. Hate it. In the same way he admonishes them for hating the deeds of Nicolaitans, we should also hate those wicked things that we have and we do. And take it to Christ. Repent. Do first works if necessary. Return and, do, and remember that great love that our Savior had for us in that he came, humbled himself, came to earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross for sins that he never committed. Three days, three nights, laid in the tomb. And then through his own power, overcame death, hell, and the grave, resurrected, seen by over 500 witnesses, and then in front of everyone, ascended up to the Father in a cloud. Amen. 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 Well, that's, that's it in a nutshell.
That's what you have to do and you must believe as a Christian. If, if you're questioning one part of that, you're missing out on who Jesus is. And, and we need to sit down and go through scripture. And it's okay. It's okay not to understand everything. But you need to, as an apostle, prophet, preacher, teacher, evangelist, for the perfecting of the saints, if there's something you don't know, let's sit down and talk about it. That's okay that you don't know. Guess what? I don't know everything either. As I open my Bible every day, I learn something. So should you, right? And come to Bible study Tuesday morning, 9 o'clock. Amen. It's good. All right, let's pray. Dear precious Heavenly Father, we love you, thank you, and praise you for being such a great and uh, awesome, amazing God to us, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity to worship you, to uh, for preach and share your word. We thank you, Father God, for the correction that comes from your word, from the admonishment that comes from your word. From, uh, from the, the embrace of your love that we know from your word how much it is that you love us. And not only from your word, but when we come to know you and embrace you as you embrace us, we know that love and experience it for ourselves and want to share that love with all that we know. We thank you, Lord, for continuing to draw us closer to you. Build that love in us and as always, Lord, help us to love others more as you loved us. We thank you, Father God, for, uh, for your uh, safety upon us. We pray, Father God, for healing and comfort for those that are sick and afflicted. We pray for that, that uh, fulfillment of your word and comforting those that are still mourning after suffering great loss. Help us, Father God, to be at peace and knowing you and walk in your peace. And we ask all this in your precious holy name. Amen and amen.